Welcome back to Political Capital. This is the intersection of political power and money. The VBS bank saga has drew in the red berets of the economic freedom fighters. In particular, the deputy president, Floyd Chivambu, and his brother, Brian. According to the forensic report into VBS saga, the great bank heist, Brian Chivambu, is one of the 53 people who received gratuitous payments from the bank. The commander-in-chief of the EFF, Julius Malema, stands by his deputy and his brother. Many people have said they are going to challenge the report. So it's not for me to say I believe it or not. The implicated people are saying they are challenging the report. So if they are successful, it means the report is null and void. If they are not successful, it means there are bases for law enforcement to move in and start prosecuting uh, people. We have never received any money from Zgamega or Grenda Zania or anything of that sort in the EFF. I'm not scared of Floyd. I've never been scared of anyone. I've, I'm not scared of Floyd. If Floyd has stolen money, he will be punished accordingly. Give me something that demonstrates that Floyd benefited from the VBS. So back to the big picture. Any one of us who's read this report will tell you that it is full of allegations of crass and brazen looting. Here's a couple of codes that will give you an idea. We gave her 300K and she cried and said we gave Junius 1.5 million rands and gave her 300K. Here's another. He receives a monthly gross salary of 400,000 rands plus a 100,000 rand travel allowance. And lastly, also, let me know if the 50 million rands from Mercado doesn't come through. We'll take this up with Denny if it doesn't. Now, so can we really expect the fallout of this bank saga, whether economic or political, to actually filter through? And when last did you hear of any successful prosecution of a politician for corruption in South Africa? I put these questions to Lumkile Modi, senior lecturer at the Wirt School of Economics and Business Science. Let's begin by looking at the VBS, VBS situation. Do you expect political expediency as a result of those that have been fingered by that report, some of the senior ranking members, particularly of the African National Congress, and also some from the opposition, the EFF. Very much so. Uh, we must not forget that that political expediency has been embedded in our genie. Uh, remember the first uh, encounter with the former president, Zuma, around Ghandla how he first mentioned to us that it was money from his pockets a and how that perspective became embedded not only in the ANC parliamentarians mm -hmm. but also in the party as a whole. Even when he changed the story um, um, and later with the public protest report and recommendation, still many of the ANC people saw nothing wrong mm -hmm. about the fact that here is a president in a constitutional democracy who has lied and therefore has to pay for lying. Mm -hmm. They never did that. So to that extent that here the very same men who lied went on to destroy all our institutions mm -hmm. and therefore we've got a society that has become a lawless um, and in that regard mm -hmm. only few institutions are holding. Our courts are holding our civil society is holding, but political parties are all about their own interest as political parties. Mm -hmm. They have got no respect for our constitution and the rule of law. It seems there's, there's a lot of skeletons buried within the VBS fall, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, from an outsider's point of view. My question is, I don't remember the last politician to go to jail as a result of corrupt activity. I only have off the top of my head Tony Ngeni. Therefore, I wonder the political will from both parties that Dito Mboweni is calling for with regards to this. So essentially asking the ANC to hold senior Limpopo ANC figures to account 
and hold uh, Floyd Chivambu, if possible, on the other side to account. My question, why would they do that? I mean, what's, there is no punitive measures if they don't do that. So why would they do that? Well, there well, could have been many countries, uh, even in South Africa, uh, under the apartheid regime. You know, we will remember that in, under the apartheid regime, we call the info scandal, mm -hmm. which led to uh, B, uh, 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 B.J. Foster mm -hmm. uh, losing power and Peter Blue Porter coming in. But you know, under the ANC, there's a lot of pussyfooting mm -hmm. um, and the lack of owning up. And that, in fact, to me, what it means, not only for the ANC, but many of these political parties, is that they've got complete disregard about their own consequence and the constitution of the republic. They'll put their own parties first, mm -hmm. as former President Zuma argued. So that approach has become part of our genius. Mm -hmm. And therefore, people will tend their back away from doing the right thing. When there's an allegation, you need to step back and say, no, I'm going to step back and wait for the process. In this case, people will continue doing what they're doing, including if there's suspicion messing with evidence that could implicate them. So therefore, it remains, it makes us, a number of us voters very skeptical about the ability of the society to stand up and deliver on accountability, on the rule of law, good governance, and a better life for all. Mr. Mandi, I like that, but I also want to explore this other thing where yesterday we heard the EFF really coming out guns blazing, and instead of holding their own to account, really blaming the regulators, the system, National Treasury, m highlighting its own irregular expenditure, and also the sub claiming that the South African Reserve Bank is the police of banks and it's their job to make sure that banks don't fall. Do you take that kind of deflection with a pinch of salt? No, I don't. Uh, I don't because remember, in many of our African countries, uh, if you look uh, at the British and the American, or what you call the Western way of economic development, mm. they have their own model mm. as to how they develop. You look at the Asian model of state-led development, we talk about China, of state capitalism, uh, under a very highly repressed society with no respect for human rights, and, uh, as well as freedom of association by Chinese. The Africans, understand very, very well. The African elite, particularly the African elite, understands very well its consequence. That is a consequence that is vulnerable to manipula manipulation. So the fact that the NCA has built uh, an infrastructure of, dis of deceiving, uh, of corruption, and has got, has, gone out, has got away with it, why do we have to expect the EFF to behave differently to sing a different tune, mm. uh, when in fact they came from the same organization. They just were in red, not black and gold. They all subscribed from charter. It's the very same people mm. that four years ago were members of the NC. So this is an extension uh, of a particular moral, uh, moral and governance um, uh, standpoint, uh, which is no different. So therefore, when you look at the FF, it's a radical uh, wing of the NC. So therefore, they'll mislead. Uh, they'll create uh, their own stories fictitiously because they know that the South African black population uh, is, ma is easy to manipulate. They will always believe what they're being told by black leadership using the past, or if not the past, using the uh, what I call black chauvinism mm. of black Africans being much more or, or coming from a history of being more oppressed than the colored or the Indian people mm -hmm. and therefore reclaiming or making claims about their own identity and the fact that you know uh, the rest is against us. So in this case Praveen Gordon becomes a bogeyman mm -hmm. for such things and an apartheid becomes the same to justify why when we are eating mm -hmm. it is correct because if you look at the apartheid regime, what we've stolen is so little 
Therefore, why Plymouth, when in fact you never blame the party regime? They never came forward in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. No one ever went after them to get the money back. So why us? Mm. Okay. One of the people who are suggesting that that politicians and political parties show political expediency with dealing with their own members is the new finance minister, Didon Bowen. He's a senior high-ranking figure within the African National Congress itself, sits on the NEC. My question, when he takes to the stage for the, for the midterm budget policy statement next week, do you, one, expect him to address VBS issue, and how? Uh, I mean, for, the, for Mr. Bowen, I think Mr. Bowen understands very, very well that, you know, in the big scheme of things, whereby we've got almost 600 billion rand uh, liability uh, at, at ESCOM or in the various uh, state-owned enterprises, that we've got a very weak balance sheet in the country running a debt to GDP ratio about 1 percent. We've got an unemployment that is the highest among middle-income countries, around 27 percent. A poverty inequality is continuing to worsen. Those are the headaches for him, not a VBS bank. So VBS is, it will be no show where, or in the presentation that we announce. I think the maleficence and the putrefaction uh, that were all smelling across uh, of corruption mm -hmm. and the fact that all uh, these political leaders, whether they're EFF or ANC, all just blow uh, their noses uh, as though they cannot smell the petrification of their own action, mm -hmm. its corruption. Mm -hmm. um, that he'll talk to, um, as we've seen uh, with the SONA and the President Ramaphosa and later Pravin Koram around the SOEs. So I think that trend will reiterate it. But I hope he doesn't talk about austerity in that speech because austerity, when in fact people are being taxed so heavily, where, whether it's personal income tax, is the consumption tax, that thing with value added tax, the, the fuel levy, but also um, the, municip the municipal utility bills, which are all putting a lot of pressure on working people. Mm. So it's really wanting to talk to those issues about how does he, in that speech, expand aggregate demand to create opportunities. And I think South Africans can tolerate even debt increasing from 51% to split of the GDP, so that that money that increase in borrowing goes towards infrastructure development, and particularly building schools and clinics, because that's where we're very, very weak. Um, as well as in the medium term, uh, with, the, with him saying, you know what, the state has to look internally uh, in the next, after the election, reduce the cabinet to about 15, about 18 people, reduce uh, 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 the, the, in fact, not reduce, but keep uh, a wage freeze on the public sector and put pressure on private sector for salary increase restraint. Mm. That sounds like a very tough uh, cacophony for anybody to try and balance. But let's go back to corruption and this Tumamina uh, spirit of Cyril Ramaphosa and his ANC. How is he going if he doesn't be, if he's not seen to be taking decisive action on VBS? How is he going to campaign next year knowing that such corruption still haunts ANC and not as a matter of the past, but as a matter of what is the contemporary? Well, I mean, his ticket really uh, is, as you have heard him talking, mm -hmm. his ticket basically is that, you know what, the mistake that you've done, I'm busy reforming give me a chance to reform. So he's been very honest, you know. But shouldn't he be decisive with VBS? Shouldn't he be asking at least his party members, as a president, to at least vacate positions until investigations are done, things like that. The problem is that we're not seeing the president come off strong. And mind you me, I know that we found out today that he is his health is a bit under. But shouldn't he be acting, as Tito Mboweni said, with steadfastness? Well, you have to look at him when he appointed the cabinet after his uh, presidential appointment. Uh, so he's unlikely to be different. So I think it will be very sad for South Africa to follow what we've seen in the rest of the continent mm. post-independence. Real institutions collapsing, the political elite living beyond its means, mm -hmm. while the masses mm. are fighting for crumbs. And I think this is the story that we're watching. 
Well, thank you for being with us again on Political Capital. We're back on your screen on Tuesday, 6.30. Until then, keep it locked.